You know, before I start this video, I, well, I have a bit of a confession to make. You see, there's a secret that I've been keeping from all of you for these many years, and I think it's about finally time that I got it all off my chest. All right, here goes. Whew. I'm psychic. Yep, that's right. I have the power to read the mind of anyone in the world, no matter where they are. Want proof? All right. What I want you to do is think about your favorite Pokemon game of all time. Your favorite one. I want you to picture it clearly in your head. The name, the box art, the music, all of it. I need you to see it clearly. Paint a complete picture in your mind's eye. And I'm going to look at that picture with my psychic powers. It'll take me a moment, but if I just focus really, really hard. Yep. Yep, yep, okay, okay, I'm getting something. I, I just need you to focus on it even harder. Just picture it as hard as you can. Okay, okay. It's coming to focus a little bit, a little bit more. Uh, it's still a little blurry. Okay, okay. Here's what I need you to do. Click the subscribe button below this video. That uh, that usually helps helps folks it a bit. Yep, yep, just right there. Just, just give it a click. Got it, got it. Oh, interesting, okay. Your favorite Pokemon game is... Whichever one you played first. Magic. It's probably pretty obvious by this point, but I really like Pokemon. I've been playing it for 15 years. Ever since Pokemon Platinum came... Wait, hang on. Pokemon Platinum came out 15 years ago? For literally over half of my entire life, I've been playing this game of imaginary creatures punching each other in the face for money, and it all started with Pokemon Platinum. For that reason, it's pretty understandable that whenever someone asks me what my favorite game in the series is, this is the one I point to. Nostalgia is a powerful influence on our minds. It's scientifically proven that we tend to remember things from our childhood more fondly than perhaps they actually were. It makes sense. But recently, I've been thinking, is Pokemon Platinum really my favorite game? It's nearly impossible to put all my nostalgia aside and look at all these games objectively. But if I could, would the Lord of the Distortion Worlds game still reign supreme? Pfft, man, come on. You've been around this channel long enough to know what comes next. Today, I devised a formula to statistically slap those rose-tinted glasses off my face and reveal the truth about which of these games I truly like the best. And the best part? I can show you how to do it too. Richard, hit that intro. Right, so I may have been lying about the whole psychic powers thing, but I do think that I can predict your actual favorite Pokemon game. Not with the power of PSI or whatever, but with the power of weighted averages. It's like magic, but actually real. It's great. However, like any good magic trick, I'm going to need some audience participation to be able to pull it off. In the description down below, you will find a link to a spreadsheet. I'm going to be explaining how it all works throughout this video. So if you download a copy for yourself and follow along as I explain everything, by the end, it should give you your own personal objective rankings of every single mainline Pokemon game. On the second page, I've included a little graphic where you can show off your rankings and I don't know, maybe you could like post it on Twitter or something with the hashtag PokeRankings and tag me at the chip tide or you know, something like that. Maybe get it trending, squeeze the last bit of engagement out of this platform before Musk burns it to the ground. Something like that. That'd be kind of cool. The spreadsheet is totally free, but if like the link isn't working or you're having some trouble with it, feel free to yell at my assistant Richard in the comments down below. It's probably his fault. I mean, I was the one who made the whole spreadsheet and got the link for it and everything, but it was probably still his fault. Pokemon games are vast pieces of media, so comparing them objectively wasn't the easiest task, especially taking into account the fact that everybody values different things in a game. It wasn't easy, but I think I managed to boil down these games into 12 distinct criteria that people might be looking for. What we're going to do here is go through all 12 criteria 
and for each one, give each main nine game in the series a score out of 10. 10 is the best, one is the worst, five is totally neutral. Now, I know, 12 is a lot to remember. So I came up with a helpful mnemonic device to make sure everything is super easy to understand. So let me present the 12 P's of a perfect Pokemon game. Those aren't two of them. In no particular order, the first P is the Pokedex. In a game all about catching Pokemon, I don't think anyone would argue that the Pokemon you catch in each game is pretty important. Now, this could mean a few different things depending on how you want to interpret it. If you're the kind of person who loves exploring every corner of the land to fill out every last page of the Pokedex and be very underwhelmed by the reward at the end, then maybe you think that the bigger the Pokedex, the better. If, like me, you go in with a team already in mind and after leaving the professor's lab for the first time, you literally never visit them again, then maybe you look for a Pokedex which has the most Pokemon you like in it. Like I said before, I encourage you to fill out this sheet with your own opinions, but I ended up ranking black and white two at the highest with nine points and the original black and white, platinum, and ultra sun and ultra moon at a close second with eight. I put the Johto games at the bottom just because looking back, there's not a whole lot of Pokemon that I really love in them, but I still put them at five points because every game is at least pretty good in this regard. And sort of branching off from there, the next P, is a populous early game. Having a huge Pokedex is awesome, but it's kind of lame if all the really cool Pokemon are packed into Victory Road right at the end. Maybe you're really into competitive battling or something, and this doesn't really matter much to you. And if that's the case, don't worry, we'll account for that later at the end. However, like I mentioned before, I'm the kind of person who likes to plan out their whole team before I even start playing, and if there's a really cool Pokemon that you can't catch until like, the seventh gym, then I'm probably never going to use it. For my own rankings, I looked at the variety of Pokemon you can catch before the second gym, since that's the point in the game where I like to at least have a solid basis of my team ready to go. The Sinnoh games reign supreme here, with some of the coolest Pokemon in the game, like Shinx and Starly available on the very first two routes of the game, and a lot of other cool options like Boizel, Machop, Geodude, Abra, Ghastly, and loads more catchable soon after. This may be controversial, but I put the Kanto games at the bottom, since it feels like literally every single route in the game has Pidgey and Rattata, and I end up using basically the same team every time. Starter, Pidgey, Nidoran, maybe a Pikachu, and then nothing till gym like five or six. The next P is pretty. Look, I've got a record saying that I don't really care much about graphics. As long as the game is fun, I'm chilling. But if I had a choice between playing this or this, I know which one I'm picking. Again, this is super subjective and everyone has their own tastes, but I put the Unova games at the top. What can I say? I'm a sucker for some good sprite work, and this was the Pokemon Company's last hurrah before moving to 3D. And don't get me wrong, I think a lot of the 3DS and Switch games look pretty good, even great in some spots, but they can also sometimes feel a little unpolished. All I'll say is, if when Game Freak decides to remake Generation 5, and they do it in a HD 2D style instead of the toy box style of BDSP, with awesome lighting and fully remastered, orchestrated music, oh boy, you may never see me again. Graphical style is one thing, but it doesn't matter much if the game doesn't have cool things to look at. So the next P is places. Places that are cool. I like my Pokemon games to have a variety of locations, not only because it usually means a wider variety of Pokemon to find, but it also gets boring looking at the same dirt, grass, and tree textures every single route. Like. I get it, Kanto was working with the limitations of the hardware at the time, and I totally respect what they managed to do, but if I have to walk through another indistinguishable plains route again, I'm gonna lose it. Compare that to something like Kalos, where one moment you're in a lush spring forest, the next you're on a beach, then an autumnal trail, then a snowy mountain pass, it's a smorgasbord of seasons up in here. And the last P of this presentation trifecta, oh, oh presentation is another P, oh, I should have used that. Uh, anyway, the next P is a poppin' soundtrack. Pokemon games have always had amazing music. Heck, even the beeps and boops of the games on the Game Boy are still a jam today, so this one was a little tricky for me, 
but I ended up putting X and Y soundtrack at the top. Not sure why, but something about the violins and flutes of Kalos have always stuck out as particularly cool to me. And tied for first is Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl. Look, I know literally the whole point of this thing was to not include any nostalgia, but a fully orchestrated soundtrack of all the songs I listened to while having my mind blown by my first ever Pokemon game as a kid? Pfft, I mean, I'm but a mortal man. We haven't talked much about anything mechanics related yet, so the next P is predicaments, also known as challenge. See, doesn't this whole P thing make it easy to remember? I know a whole lot of people like to criticize the newer games for being too easy, but I'm more of the opinion that Pokemon games have always been easy, you just got better and learned how the type chart works. However, I will say that after playing so much Pokemon, any battle that makes me think, even for a second or so, is appreciated. One battle that instantly jumps to mind is the Ultra Necrozma fight from Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon. The rest of the game isn't that hard, maybe a little bit more challenging than your average quest to be the very best like no one ever was, until they throw a Pokemon literally stronger than God at you with busted type coverage and a free stat boost that gave many a Pokemon veteran their first trip back to a Pokemon Center in maybe years. Pokemon Legends Arceus comes in at the bottom of this one because, well, I mean, there were like five battles in the whole game. The challenge mode in Black and White 2 was also a welcomed addition, though only having it available after you've beaten the whole game once is objectively dumb. Like, you took the time to code it all into the game, just let people who want it select hard mode right from the start. And that brings us perfectly into our next P, please don't waste my time. This is sort of a catch-all category that rewards games that basically don't make you do dumb stuff. Because as beloved as Pokemon is, sometimes there is a lot of crap to slog through. Some of this stuff is obvious, like filling the world with HM obstacles so you need to ruin your team's moveset with Cut and Rock Smash for the whole game, or have one Pokemon entirely dedicated to HMs, caves filled with more Zubat than there are actual bats in real life, having move deleters and move relearners locked away in end game areas, stuff like that. Pokemon has certainly made strides towards fixing these things in recent games. Finally removing HMs was amazing and having TMs not break after you use them was great. Until Scarlet and Violet brought breakable moves back, which I don't get, but you know, whatever. It was also the addition of the updated EXP shares in Generation 6, which attempted to eliminate the need for grinding, but has backfired so completely and utterly that it has legitimately close to ruined some of the more recent Pokemon games for me. No, Richard, don't cut away. I don't care that you've heard this rant before and you think it's a weird hill for me to die on. I will die on this hill. The people need to know. Look, I'll admit it. I'm the kind of guy who likes to have all my Pokemon at the same level. You get your whole team to, I don't know, say, 30, then you cycle through them one at a time until they've all reached 31, and then you do it again. If you catch a new Pokemon that's a bit underleveled, all you gotta do is slap the EXP share on them until they're all caught up, and you're good to go. It was an ingenious system, perfectly balanced, that constantly encouraged you to be using every Pokemon in your team, and it was great. I mean, it was perfect. And then, the Generation 6 EXP share came along. For those of you who don't know, instead of the XP share being a held item, it was instead a key item that you could toggle on and off in the menu. If you had it on, some of the experience from every battle would be shared among every Pokemon in your party, not just the one that you designated. And you know what? It was fine. It made training up a new Pokemon a little more annoying since turning on the EXP share to get some free experience would also make the rest of your team get higher leveled and then it would take even longer for it to catch up. But it also provided a subtle little difficulty setting that we've been begging for where if you wanted the game to be easy, you just turn on the EXP share and you get a bit over leveled. Or you can keep it off and you're a little under leveled and then it's a little harder. It didn't really accomplish its goal of removing grinding, but I mean, come on. It's X and Y, those games were super easy anyway. But it was fine. And then, Generation 8 came along and completely ruined it beyond repair. The EXP share feature works exactly the same as in Generation 6 and 7, except they removed the ability 
to turn it off. Now, having a team that was all the same level is nigh on impossible, since while you're trying to catch someone else up in levels, the rest of your team just keeps getting higher and higher. I remember in Scarlet and Violet, I caught a Sharkadet, and it was significantly lower than the rest of my team. I knew if I didn't use it, then it would never catch up to the rest of my team. So I put it in the front of my party and told myself I would keep it there until it caught up in levels, and then I would put someone else up front. And you know what? Eventually, it did. After like five gyms, when I said screw it, deposited the rest of my team in the PC so they stopped soaking up experience and grinded the stupid thing up. The exact thing that the EXP share was supposed to avoid uh, in the first place. I spent half the damn game with a crappy Charcadet that I didn't even know how to evolve until the very end because I had to Google it because it's weird in that game just to try and have a balanced team. And crucially, I didn't get to use my other cool Pokemon that I wanted as much, lest they leap even further ahead in levels. Oh boy. Game Freak tried to fix an item that already worked perfectly and ended up, well, they broke it a little bit, but it still kind of worked all right. And then they just took a hammer to it and reduced it to toxic dust that not only failed to solve the original problem, but makes it worse. Oh boy. Just let me toggle the EXP share for specific Pokemon on my team, or better yet, just give me five of the old EXP share items. Problem solved. It's not rocket science, people. So yeah, any game with the forced EXP share was immediately ranked at a five or below. Except Legends Arceus, because levels literally do not matter in that game. There's no battling. But, you know, if you don't care as much about that whole thing as I do and think I'm crazy, I mean, you can just use the HM thing. All right, but getting down from my soapbox there, let's move on to the eighth P, a poetic story. Look, I'll be the first to admit it, Pokemon games are not famous for their amazing storytelling. It usually boils down to, kid leaves home at professor's request to complete the Pokedex, they probably ignore it, they face several tests of their strength along the way in some sort of organized league, they battle some full-grown adults that call themselves Team Something with a very stupid plan that you could think, hmm, that's a bad idea in about five seconds, and you save the day, the end. However, there are certain games that go above and beyond and have characters with, what? Character development? Let's be honest, the best stories can be boiled down to people who started one way and ended another. And no, starting with zero badges and ending with eight doesn't count. N from Black and White, Lily from Sun and Moon, and Arvin from Scarlet and Violet are some of the few characters that really stand out to me as actually being interesting, and so those games rank the highest. Oh, hang on, gotta get back on my uh, soapbox for a moment here. And then there's games like Sword and Shield that has maybe, maybe half an interesting character in how 2.0, and fails at even the basic Pokemon formula. Most of the game literally doesn't have an antagonist at all, seeing as the evil Team Yell literally never antagonizes you. And then halfway through the league, at the very end, they were like, oh, uh, well, crap, we don't have any villain. Uh, uh, hey, hey, uh, remember that, that one dude that you saw in the opening cutscene and you had like, I don't know, coffee with or sometime? Well, he's the bad guy. Why? But hey, that's just my opinion. I'm not trying to say that the story in those games are objectively bad or anything. I'm just, I'm just, actually, no, that's exactly what I'm saying. <laughs> but maybe you could care less about dynamic characters and interesting relationships. Maybe you're the kind of person who likes a roller coaster of a story packed to the gills with amazing plot twists. Well, don't you worry, folks. I see you too. The ninth P is perplexing twists. I guess I could have just done plot twists. While the newer Pokemon games, with some exceptions, I feel in general have had better stories overall, when it comes to twists, Gen 1 is still king. Finding out the mysterious leader of the very first gym you found that's been locked your whole journey belonged to none other than the mob boss of Team Rocket Giovanni was freaking awesome. And getting through the whole Elite Four only to find out that your cocky rival already beat you to it and is the current reigning champ you'll have to face? Well, that's the coolest thing since, well, since the Giovanni thing. 
Gen 2 is also no slouch either. Wait until you've beaten the entire game before saying, oh yeah, Kanto. Also, getting to fight Red, the player character from the previous game, was awesome. I kind of feel like recent Pokemon games have lost the art of the plot twist. Like, remember when they tried to convince you for a second that Lysander wasn't the villainous leader of Team Flair? I mean, like, dude walks in looking like this and says, he looks into the distance and says, my desire is for a more beautiful world. And everyone's like, ha oh, man, that Lysander, isn't he such a cool guy? Or for a more recent example, look to Scarlet and Violet. Spoiler warning, I guess, even though it's super obvious, but we all knew that Penny, Cassiopeia, and the anonymous Team Star leader were the same person, like, the moment Cassiopeia called you for the first time. Like, literally the moment you call, I was like, oh, that's the girl from outside, isn't it? We're getting close to the end. Only three P's left to go. Pokemon games are always pretty big, so if you want to hold my attention for the whole adventure, then there better be plenty of stuff to do. I'm talking about optional areas. I'm talking about secret battles. I'm talking about, I don't know, contests if you're into that sort of stuff. But I got to give special props to the Battle Frontiers of Emerald and the Gen 4 games, which provide literally endless extra battles so you can keep playing these games forever if you wanted. Hits 2023, which means the age of the open world game is squarely upon us. Nowadays, if a game doesn't have four times bigger than Skyrim on the box or something, chances are it ain't worth people's times. Gone are the days of linear hallways. Never again will gyms be locked to a set order. Paths? We make our own paths. All right, I'll admit it, that one might've been a bit of a stretch. This one's pretty self-explanatory, the more opportunities for exploration, the better. Pokemon has actually been experimenting with exploration since the very beginning. Kanto offers you a surprising amount of freedom in the order you tackle the middle few gyms. But of course, Legends Arceus and Scarlet and Violet take the cake, giving you a completely open world to explore totally at your own pace. Wow. And finally, the last of the 12 Ps of Pokemon, a truly excellent game must be perfectly balanced as all things you oh crap i want a game that lets me enter the flow state where you're always at the perfect level that provides just the right level of challenge you never have to grind but if you wanted to there was always a patch with high level pokemon right nearby most games are pretty good in this regard brilliant diamond and shining pearl were completely broken by the forced exp share thing but i've already talked about that so i won't bring it up again it sucked however I think that a lot of the more open Pokemon games actually struggle in this regard. The wild Pokemon in the Johto region are criminally underleveled, making grinding take forever. And there are a few parts of the game that have like super weird high level jumps that you couldn't possibly prepare for. And for all its emphasis on freedom in Scarlet and Violet, none of the gyms or important battles scale with your level so nine times out of ten when you approach a new area you're either very over leveled and it's very boring because you just breeze through the whole thing or you are super under leveled because the game didn't want you to come here yet and you're pretty much forced to turn away i think gens three through five struck the perfect balance here so it's no surprise really that those are the games that i find myself coming back to the most so those are the 12 p's that make up a Pokemon game. If you haven't yet, you can pause the video now and go through the spreadsheet and rank each game on a scale from one to 10 in each P. But we're not done quite yet. While those P's do encompass everything about a Pokemon game, different people might value certain P's more than others. That's where the weights come in. If you scroll all the way over to the right hand side of the sheet, you'll find the weights section. This part requires just a tiny bit of math on your part, but I promise it's not that bad. What you're going to want to do is assign each P a percentage out of 100 possible percent based on how important it is to you, with a higher percentage meaning it's more important. Different P's can have the same percentage if you value them the same, that's all fine. The only thing you need to make sure of is that all 12 of them eventually add up to exactly 100%. As an example, here's what I did for my percentages. You can just copy those numbers if you don't want to do the math, move them around, or do it yourself. I don't really care. I ranked Pokedex, Populous Early Game, 
predicaments and perfectly balanced at the highest at 12.2%. Places that are cool, pop and soundtrack, and please don't waste my time are at 8.5%. Pretty, poetic story, perplexing twists, and plenty of stuff to do is at 6.3%. And to be honest, I don't really care about exploration in games as much as most people do. I'm perfectly content to have a completely linear experience as long as it's a fun experience. So I put that at just half a percent. But again, these are just my opinions. So take some time to fill out all the percentages in the top row of this section, then copy and paste those same numbers to every single row of the weight section. I've set up the spreadsheet so that it will now do the rest of the math for you. So just take a gander at the rightmost column, highlight it in green, and you'll see that it's given every single game in the series a score out of 10. If you highlight that whole column, right click it and sort it in reverse alphabetical order, it'll show you your rankings for every single game. So after feeling everything in myself, I'm happy, sad to say, honestly, I'm not sure, but Pokemon Platinum has been dethroned as my favorite game falling to third place in my overall rankings. Instead, taking its place at the top of the mountain is Pokemon Black 2 and White 2. And you know what? Yeah, I 100% agree. These are the best looking games in the whole series, bar none. They play great, they sound great, they've got a great variety of Pokemon, awesome early game spots for building a team like Flockacy Ranch and the Verbeck Complex, and it was the swan song of the best version of the EXP share before, well, you know. I can't really think of a single bad thing to say about it, except that maybe the story is pretty bland when compared to the original Black and White, which came in at number two of my rankings, by the way. But even so, the story didn't hinder my enjoyment of the games at all, and boarding the Team Plasma ship like a freaking pirate, it was pretty sweet. Honestly, I think I always knew that these games were my favorite, I just never had the heart to say anything but Platinum. But now, whenever someone asks what my favorite game in the series is, I can say, with 100% statistically backed confidence, that it is in fact Pokemon Black 2 and White 2. But that's just what I got. I would love to hear what everyone else gets after filling it out and how it compares to what you said your favorite was coming in. Do you think I'm right? Did I get it totally wrong? Did I maybe make you realize some deep buried love for a game you don't often think about? Have I perhaps sparked an existential crisis where you realize that the things you loved as a kid weren't as good as you remember them and that you'll never be able to recapture the feeling that they gave you because it wasn't the games at all that gave you that feeling, but actually the lack of knowledge about the stress and responsibilities that awaited you in adulthood and that's a feeling that you will forever be chasing but never be able to recapture. My bad, I guess.